All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Micha Weinblatt, and I'm the host of tonight's After Hours with Bob Diener. Uh, I'm honored to serve on the Young Leadership Board of Directors in Washington, D.C. By day, I'm the founder and CEO of Crooked Monkey, a merchandise agency that designs and produces apparel for organizations and companies throughout the country. But that was before Corona. Uh, now we've pivoted to become a medical supply company sourcing uh, PPE uh, and masks for nursing homes. And of course, we're also doing branded face masks. This last September, I got to travel uh, to Israel with an FIDF young professional group. I've been to Israel over 20 times, and this was the most memorable experience. FIDF knows how to inspire, and they know how to get you behind the headlines. The most impactful visit was to a base that lifts Israelis out of poverty by getting citizens from the periphery ready for the army. Not every 18-year-old is emotionally or mentally capable to serve in the army. This base makes sure that they get a fair shot at life in Israel after the army. It's part of FIDF's Project Overcome, which hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about, which is the embodiment of the adage, all of Israel is responsible for one another. Thank you for joining us tonight. Since the next season of FAUDA is, uh, doesn't come for another 12 months, we knew you had some extra time on your hands. It's a, uh, it's a crazy time we're living in right now. While people around the world are fighting the spread of coronavirus, the soldiers of the FIDF have an even more difficult job. Because on top of the present threat of COVID-19, they have to continue to protect Israel's borders and people from neighboring threats. We've gathered here tonight to listen to Bob and learn more about the FIDF. The brave men and women of the IDF are putting their lives on the line to protect Israel. The friends of the IDF are supporting them by offering educational, cultural, recreational, and social services to pr programs and facilities that provide hope, purpose, and life-changing support for the soldiers of Israel and their families. And with that, it is my distinct honor to introduce you to Bob Diener, who is not only the co-founder and president of getaroom.com, which was awarded the best hotel booking site by fromers.com and is also a great friend of the IDF. He co-founded and served as the past president of hotels.com, taking the company public in 2000 and merging it with Expedia in 2003. And I just learned he's a former mayor of his city. Uh, he's also a leading industry expert. Bob is a frequent source for many major news organizations, as well as a recurring guest on many television and radio stations, including NBC, CNN, and Fox News, and is a published author of two books, The Biblical Secrets to Business Success and The Savvy Traveler. Hello, Bob. Long time no interview. I mean, um, it's great to be on with you tonight. <laughs> uh, when I had interviewed you last in early March, uh, you, I don't know if you remember this, but you had said, do you want to ask me a question about the coronavirus? And I said, eh, what's so interesting about that? And I guess that's why I'm interviewing you and you're not interviewing me. So now two months later, I can finally ask, um, how do you think the pandemic uh, has and will continue to affect the hotel industry and specifically uh, getaroom.com? Okay, well, of course, great question. And but the answer is that nobody really knows, right? right? The experts don't really know. And we're, you know, we're planning for, for basically the worst, but we hope for the best. And we're, and we're using all the information that we have. You know, we're looking at other countries like China, South Korea, and, and other places that were hit with the pandemic before we were, just to see what happened there in the travel industry. But the bottom line is that the, the travel industry obviously is one of the industries that is most affected by the virus. And, and the entire industry is going to change. You know, airlines are the most impacted. Uh, flights, uh, although flights may be full, capacity is way down or semi-full. But airlines are operating at somewhere between 5 and 10% of what they were operating at just a few months ago. You know, hotels today, uh, you know, we're starting to see bookings picking up. But still, most hotels that are open are only operating at somewhere between 10 and about 30, 35% of, of, uh, of capacity. Uh, and, and we expect kind of a steady, slow increase in bookings, but we believe it's gonna be a significant period of time until we get back to where we were. And it likely will be sometime in 2022, maybe even 23, 
wow. before we get back to numbers of what we were seeing in January, February of this year. So a lot of things are going to change. You know, for example, in the hotel industry, uh, the way you used to see hotels, the way you used to check into hotels is all going to change. So the front desk is going to change. You're going to basically go to an app or go online and register for your room in advance. There's going to be very few touch points with people. You know, elevators will likely be automatic. Uh, if the restaurants will have significant spacing if there's even a restaurant in the hotel. The public spaces will be changed. So they're very well spaced out. So it, it's going to change quite a bit. And the patterns, you know, we're seeing very different patterns in terms of the way people are traveling right now. For example, people are staying in more upscale hotels. Now the rates are down. Uh, you know, one of the biggest problems in, in, the, in the travel industry is not just the occupancy or the, or the yield but it's that rates are way down. So it's really a double hit. You know, number one, occupancy is way down. And number two, rates are way down. So that's a double hit for the industry. So, but what's happening is, is that people are opting for more upscale hotels. So, uh, you know, the pricing is better. So they're getting better deals than what they used to get. But they also, there's a feeling that if the hotel is more upscale, it's likely cleaner and likely to have less issues. That's not necessarily the case. That's the way a lot of people think. And, and people are, are now driving much more than flying to go somewhere. And that's what we expect probably for the next year, year and a half. A lot more people will be driving to their destination than flying. I mean, earlier this year and historically, it's about four to five times as many people drive versus fly to their destination. That number is going to go way up. We're also going to see a shorter stays, we're going to see international travel will take a much longer to rebound than domestic travel. So uh, there's going to be a lot of different changes. Also, you know, people are going to different places. You know, one of the top markets that I saw today being booked was Pensacola, Florida. I mean, how many people were going to Pensacola, Florida? But it was a top five destination right now, which is highly unusual. So people are going to different places. They're avoiding major cities. They're going to beaches, that towns that are open. They're going to more... Uh, big national parks. So the whole paradigm of travel is going to change over the next somewhere, you know, year to two years. Have you seen any interesting startups start to emerge or ways to kind of help either new hotels or hotels kind of figure out this whole situation? Well, there's been a great acceleration of technology build outs. For example, many hotels were experimenting with the, the automated check-in, where basically you go to an app, you pick, you can actually pick your exact room. So this was technology that uh, it was a handful of chains and a small percentage of their hotels were testing. Well, now it's being accelerated into production because it's going to be the norm. Uh, you know, hotels now are expecting for all services like Get A Room or other companies that book travel to provide the hotel with the profile of the person before they get there. That's something we didn't necessarily do before, but that's something we're programming for right now. So the hotel can be in touch with the guests before, understand their needs, get them pre-checked in, ask them basic questions. For example, uh, have you been with anyone that's had a fever? Do you have a fever? Have you traveled outside the country? So they're going to do all this. They're going to ask all this information before a guest gets there. So they can, uh, so they can be confident that it's a person that uh, isn't currently ill. Uh, and uh, they want to have a smooth check-in with the person. So uh, a lot of companies are developing to this technology and, and companies are adapting to the, to the online environment and to the you know, virtual environment much faster than before. So we're seeing a great acceleration and we are seeing a lot of entrepreneurs. We're seeing a lot of travel companies that were startups, uh, you know, just uh, in, in, in different areas, especially when it comes to uh, you know, special needs of travelers and, and uh, you know, technology to make a company more virtual, those are all accelerating now. And we'll see a lot more, and, and we'll see new companies that are popping up are going to be companies that provide special needs to, to what the current, you know, recurrent requests are. And can you talk a little bit about how it's affected uh, your company, actually internally, um, everyone going remote, um, and how that's kind of changed the culture and, and, and how you see that moving forward? So getaroom.com right now is operating 100% virtually. So, and we have you know, agents that used to be in a call center, now they're at home. You know, our offices 
uh, where, where people would come in and you know, people are fairly close together, especially in areas like customer service and accounting, are all working remote. So we're actually amazed how efficient we are as a company working totally remote. And we probably will not renew leases at some of our offices because we really don't need them. Uh, we don't need the amount of space. And if we renew them, we may renew with a smaller amount of space, we'll probably stagger workers. We'll have, probably have a common use conference room that will book. So the bottom line is that we will be much more virtual going forward than we were in the past. And a lot of companies will go that way. And, uh, and that saves time. You know, what my executives are telling me that the Bob, we're so much more productive. Employees don't have to drive to work. There's a lot less chit chat. Um, people are so much more efficient. And we can also hire people that maybe we couldn't hire before because maybe we have uh, you know, an incredible working at home mom that needs to stay home with the kids, but they couldn't come into the office. Now they can work from home. So it actually expands the pool of talent that we have access to. Um, in 2008, you called the Great Recession the Great Wake Up. Um, so we saw many big financial institutions had closed their doors. How did you survive that time? And what advice can you share with uh, young leadership uh, professionals, much of, much of whom have to reinvent themselves uh, in their career paths due to the current situation? Sure. So yeah, I've been in travel for about you know, 30 years. So I've been through the Great Recession, SARS, Ebola, uh, stock market crash in 87, uh, several different recessions. So, uh, you know, this, this is very different and it's very different because of the longevity of what's going on and because we don't know when we're gonna have a solution. But the other issues were much more short term. But what we've seen every time is a dramatic rebound. Uh, even during 9-11, where travel came to a complete stop, within several weeks later, travel was almost back to normal. You know, a couple of days after people were afraid to get on an airplane, people were afraid to travel. But within a few weeks, a few months, travel is higher than it was before 9-11. So you know, travel is just, it's one of the great rights that we have. It's a great way of expressing our freedom. People love to travel. People love to go, they love to explore, they love to meet people, try new foods, see new countries, speak another language. So it's just one of the greatest, uh, it's one of the greatest pleasures that we have. And as long as people feel safe, people will travel. So we will ultimately have a full rebound plus, right? But in the interim, in the next couple of years, until we really have a vaccine that we know works. And I know we hear a lot of rumors and you know, yesterday there we was positive news, today there's negative news. We're gonna have a lot of that back and forth. But this is, this is gonna take some time to work itself out. And it may be a vaccine, it may fizzle out over time, that's possible. We may have herd immunity over time. We really don't know, but eventually we will get back to where we were plus and travel will rebound and people get up and go again. So what do you have to do as an entrepreneur, as someone running a company in the interim? You have to really take the facts that are in front of you, make an assessment and plan accordingly. So it means being able to change, being able to adapt. It, it's really adaption. So, uh, you know, we, we, you know, during 9-11, uh, during people couldn't get on planes for a while. People weren't, didn't want to fly. So people were driving more. So again, it was kind of that shift to more the at-home market and then to move back to people flying again, even, even, even in bigger numbers. Uh, but as a company, you need to adapt, you need to look at what's going on, you need to make the proper changes. If you need to make some, uh, some reductions or move, move people to different areas, you need to do that. We try to make people as productive as we can. And, and we try to make sure that we put employees at what they do best. And that's one of the biggest failures that companies have, uh, is that they may have, they may have wonderful employees, but they have them in the wrong positions. They have them doing the wrong tasks. So we constantly try to look, especially during stress periods, we try to look at each of our employees, each of our executives, and ask the question, are they the right person for the position? Can they grow and adapt and make the changes? Maybe they should be in a different position. Should they be with the company or not be with the company? Should they be handling a different division, a different area? What's their strength? What's their weakness? So we try to, uh, so especially during the stress periods, we try to make changes in management, changes uh, and changes with our employees that ultimately make us a better company. 
we look at all our expenses. You know, companies get killed on having too fat of a bottom line. Uh, and so we're constantly looking at our expenses. We're constantly trying to reduce them. We're constantly looking for efficiencies. And, and I'm always amazed that we're constantly able to find areas of efficiency, especially now. During this crisis, we are, we're outsourcing more. We're renegotiating leases. We're renegotiating contracts. We're finding, uh, you know, we're able to get much better rates on a lot of our services. So, uh, you know, when there are stress periods, companies should take advantage of it and try to make sure that you're set up for the long run and you adapt to the changes. Talking about adapting, you started your uh, career as a lawyer. Um, and then you transitioned from uh, a career in law to working in the hospitality industry. Can you talk a little bit about that jump um, and how you were able to, I guess, pivot? Uh, sure. So I'll just tell them about my background. So, um, you know, I grew up in Miami. I went to I went to a Jewish day school and I ended up, I went to college at Florida. So, yes, I'm a Gator. If there's any uh, Gators out there. And then I went to law school at Cornell and I started practicing a big law firm, a Gibson Dunn. It's one of the largest law firms in the country out in Los Angeles. And I had a little I had a little side business I started in law school that helped put me through law school, which was an airline ticket business. We were an airline consolidator where we bought up bulk seats and we resold them. Uh, and so I had that business part time while I practiced law. And the business got larger and larger, especially as airlines started announcing their frequent flyer programs. Airlines started giving out coupons where if you took a flight, say on United Airlines, they would give you 50% off your next flight. Well, I was amazed that I, as I was flying around the country, people were taking those coupons and throwing them in the garbage. So I picked them up and I realized, hey, these are really valuable. And so I took them and I sold them to travel agencies at a nice profit. And that business grew and grew and more and more airlines were giving out these discount coupons and free coupons. So this turned into a great exchange and I had it kind of as a part-time business while I practice law. Well, after a couple of years of practicing, uh, my business, my airline ticket business was doing better. I was earning more in the airline ticket business than I was in, in the, at the law firm. So I decided to make, uh, I took a leave of absence for several months and I hopped on the plane and I went to Hawaii and I opened up an office in Hawaii and it turned out to be a gold mine. And I made a deal, I have a partner, his name is Dave Littman that I've had for, for over 30 years. And Dave was a lawyer in, in uh, Dallas, Texas, working at a firm called Johnson and Swanson. And so Dave and I made a deal. And we were in the, we actually were in the airline ticket business together. And the deal was that I was gonna leave, go to Hawaii, open an office there. He would stay at his law firm, wait for his bonus, and we would split everything, 50-50. Well, it turns out that, again, the travel business was doing so much better than his salary and bonus that eventually uh, he left his law firm and we both went into it full time. And our business kept expanding and expanding. Eventually we sold our airline business and we were bored. We were sitting around on the beach with nothing to do. And uh, my wife was pushing me to get out of the house and get off the beach. So Dave and I, we took a trip down to Belize and we went scuba diving for a few days while we were trying to figure out what are we gonna do next? And we knew the travel business because we were in the airline business. And we realized that the hotel business has such great potential. Why? Because it's so competitive. You know, the airlines you only had a few, you only have a handful of airlines. So they really control the pricing and it's difficult to negotiate. But with hotels, there's over 50,000 hotels in the US. There's over 4,000 hotels in a market like Paris. So if we couldn't deal with one hotel, we'd go across the street and then the original hotel wants to negotiate. And so uh, because there's so much competition, it turned out to be a great market. And the average hotel occupancy when we started in the hotel business was only about 65%. And hotels needed about 70% to break even. So you know, hotels needed the business. And at the time it was very difficult for someone to find a hotel, say in a busy period, what do you do when it's Super Bowl or Mardi Gras? You call and at the time, there was no internet then, you call and you call and you call. And it took a lot of time and effort to try to find a hotel. Uh, but we came up with a system, you called one number, one central number, and we had access to most of the hotels in that destination. 
And not only could we get you to tell you who has availability, but we would get you a deal. So that was the beginning of Hotel Reservations Network. And then something big happened in 1995. I, I know it sounds like the Stone Age, it really was. A friend of a friend you know, kept banging on the door. His name was Dave Ray. And he says, Bob, I have the greatest thing since sliced bread that I have to show you. I said, what is it? He says, it's the internet. Now nobody knew what the internet was. So I said, all right, come on in, show it to me. He showed it to me. He built a system for gaming, for online games on the internet. He says, Bob, we need to do this for hotels. I said, Dave, I don't know. We really don't want to invest in this. It's too speculative. And at the time, the internet was very, very slow. The way you would get to the internet was you would plug into a phone line and you would watch one letter by one letter coming in. Then you would, uh, and you would wait. It would take forever to get something back and forth. Um, but he says, Bob, I'm going to make you a deal. He says, I'm going to build a site for you. He says, you get a name. You can buy an, you can buy a name for $10. We bought the name hoteldiscount.com. By the way, you could buy almost any name uh, you know, at that time for about $10 a year. So we bought tons of names. He says, I'm going to build a site for you, no charge, and you pay me a 10% commission. He said, Dave, you got a deal. So he builds the site, a couple of months it's finished, and we have our deal, we pay him the 10% commission. By 1990s, by the next year, 96, it's already 5 to 10% of our business, even though it's so slow. And then something really big happens. The real industrial revolution for us was in October of, of uh, 97, when the internet becomes um, totally interactive. So at that point, you could send an email and actually get a response back instantly. Well, that was an amazing thing. And that really is what exploded our business. And it started growing exponentially. And we kept growing and growing. And the story goes on from there. And uh, of course, eventually we became hotels.com, we sold it. and Several years later, I'm here with a new company, GetARoom.com. Not so new anymore, but uh, uh, with a little bit, with a little different angle on the business. Are you Are you sitting on any other uh, business ideas we should know about? Well, I'm very focused. So, uh, you know, my greatest tip to entrepreneurs is: if you want to succeed, you really have to focus. You have to find a value proposition, and you have to focus on what you're really good at and what you're really, and what you really have as a value proposition for your customers. Because so many entrepreneurs, they want to try to do everything under the sun, and it really doesn't work that way. You need to focus on a specific product, be really good at it, and be an expert in your field. Okay. Well, on that note, can you talk a little bit about what it means to be a conservative entrepreneur and a conservative um, investor? I believe, I believe you sold all your shares of Hotels.com. Is that accurate? Sure. So I'm what you call, again, a conservative entrepreneur. So a conservative entrepreneur looks at the risk and looks at the reward. Uh, a conservative entrepreneur is very careful about his bottom line. So there's so many, you know, when we went, uh, we started, I told you a little about my story with the internet. Uh, we started in 95. By 1999, there were so many companies in the marketplace. You know, very few exist anymore. But there were so many companies that were offering services on the internet and they had huge valuations. They were losing tons of money and they would spend 50, 100%, even more than 100% of their revenues on marketing and really no expectation of having a return. And the market was so crazy that when we went to, to go public for the first time in late 1999, we went to Wall Street, we put our suits on, almost every single banker turned us down. And we couldn't figure it out because we were very profitable. We were growing at triple digit rates. But all the big bankers, you know, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, they all told us we have a big problem. I said, what's the problem? They said, you're not spending enough on market and you're too profitable. So what do you mean we're too profitable? They said, our investors aren't interested in profits. Now, our investors want to see growth and they want to see companies that are spending almost all their earning and revenues uh, on, on marketing and expansion. And we want to see you take a significant loss for two, or, for two or three quarters and then come back to us. Well, we found a much more conservative banker that loved our model. 
and it was it was DLJ at the time, which became Credit Suisse. And they were our lead banker going public, and we were oversubscribed 20 times. And we were successful all the way till, uh, they're still successful, obviously. And we had a similar, we have similar success with getaroom.com because we're very careful about what we do. So what does that mean? We're methodical. We watch our numbers. We watch our spend. We measure every spend. We watch our bottom line. Uh, and so we're careful. And when you're careful and you really look at your expenses and you look at your ROI, your return on your investment, um, that's part of being a conservative entrepreneur. And that's something, by the way, I learned from Proverbs because you know Proverbs says it's much better to be the creditor than the debtor. And the one thing I learned from Proverbs uh, growing up in a Jewish home and, and going to Jewish day school um, is that uh, you know, I always learned that it's not, it's, not a, it's not a great idea to, do, to take a lot of leverage. And you know, I learned that again in the Great Recession, and you see that again today. Companies that have great leverage are the ones that are really suffering. Companies that don't have a lot of debt and leverage, they can make it through an extended period of time. Even with coronavirus and even with sales significantly depressed, if you don't have debt and you don't have great leverage, you can last a long time through crises and come out the other end incredibly strong. It's those companies that take excessive leverage and go, go into excessive debt that have significant problems when we have uh, you know, pressure points like we have right now. So part of being a conservative entrepreneur is being careful about what you do, is measuring everything that you do, is watching your bottom line and not getting into heavy debt and not taking a ton of leverage. But yes, I did sell my hotels.com stock, um, but that's uh, because we ended up selling the company and the decision we made, we went through several, uh, we sold several different tranches. So we, when we initially um, sold our company to USA and Networks, or you know, currently USAI today. Uh, so we'd sold uh, a, a, a majority interest. And why did we do that? We had pretty much our entire net worth in the company and we wanted to diversify our risk. And so what we did was we didn't sell everything. We kept a significant portion. And we also kept a portion, we made a deal that if we went public, we would get back a portion of the company. And so even though hotels.com correct growing and growing, the, the part that we retained, we did incredibly well with. So you know, if we held it all, we could have held it all. We could have you know, more rolled the dice and taken more risk. But again, my partner and I are conservative and we wanted to take a lot of the chips off the table, but we wanted to keep the upside. We did the same thing at Get A Room. We sold Get A Room about a year and a half ago to a large private equity company, but we kept about 30% about of the company. So we still have a huge upside. We took a lot of chips off the table. We reduced our risk significantly, but we still have a lot of upside. And that's good all timing. about being an entrepreneur. Good timing. So you, say, front. Yeah. you say good timing, but um, companies, again, if you don't have a lot of leverage, you know, we'll go through this period and, you know, maybe it's a year and a half, maybe it's two years, maybe it's two years, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, a get a room would do well and other companies that, that have you know, made changes and adapted, again, don't have a lot of leverage that can come out of this, will do fine. It just, uh, you know, the numbers will uh, come back in a couple of years. So, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that the, the companies are, are not going to be incredibly valuable. They will down the road. It's just going to take some time. I've got two more questions for you, Bob. One is you mentioned uh, Proverbs and, and, your, and your Jewish day school background. Um, what do you attribute to your success? Well, you know, it's funny because I was at a, uh, a dinner a few years ago, Shabbat dinner, and someone asked me, you know, I talked about uh, Get a Room and how uh, it would reach the next milestone of profitability and of growth and maturity as a company. And the question was, how did you know what to do? You know, I came right out of law school uh, and went right into practicing law and I had a business on the side. I went into that business full time. So I didn't really have any training. I didn't work for a big, you know, big, uh, um, big business company. I practiced law. So how did, I, how did you know what to do? And the answer I gave them was whatever I knew I learned growing up. I learned in law school. I learned in Jewish day school. So some fundamental principles that I believe um, ultimately led to my success at hotels.com, today at getaroom.com, really all the ventures I've been involved in. 
And I actually wrote a book about this called The Biblical Secrets to Business Success a couple of years ago. You can get it on Amazon. So what are those? Well, you know, the first thing that I learned growing up was that you have to tear everything apart. I call it doing your homework. And I'm amazed at how many entrepreneurs don't do their homework. So what does that mean? You know, for years in Jewish day school, I learned Talmud. And this rabbi's arguing with that rabbi and they're tearing this apart and they're giving all sides of the argument. Well, you know, when I got to law school, it was the exact same thing. And in business, it's the exact same thing. So when you have an idea, you have a suggestion, you have something you think is gonna be great in the marketplace, you just don't go do it. You tear it apart. So I do that with my partner. We go back and forth and we tear ideas apart. And then what we do is we put together focus groups. So let me give you an example. We decided to start another uh, hotel company. We had to come up with a name. And obviously the name was getaroom.com. But we had a lot of names we were looking at. For example, we had I rooms and E rooms and check in and check out just to give you, you know, an idea. So we had 10 names that we could acquire. And, you know, I had my ideas of what I thought would be the best name, but you know, I want to hear other people's opinion. So what I did was I put together a focus group. And when you put together a focus group, you really get you know, kind of a good, a good idea from other people. And you get some real scrutiny on your idea. So I asked them to rate all these names from one to 10. And there were 100 people, and they're people that I respected, a lot of marketing people, um, a lot of uh, senior business executives. And by the way, I also had, uh, I had a rabbi and I had a Baptist minister in, in, uh, in the mix because I wanted to get their, their you know, perception also because the, the potential innuendo from the name. So we got them back. You know, most of the names were the whole range. You know, maybe there were a lot of sixes, a lot of sevens, but getaroom.com had ones and tens. About half the people were ones and two. They were on one side of it. It was a barbell uh, type of response. And the other half were the nine and 10. So I thought that was great because, you know, when you have a name for a company, you want people to remember the name. And whether they love it or they hate it, they talk about it. And it actually was the, the, the least cost of acquiring the name of all the names we had was getaroom.com. But people again loved it or hate it. And so then we were concerned. So I went to the, I went to the Baptist minister. I said, what do you think? Because I was worried about the innuendo from the name. And the Baptist minister loved it. So I went to the rabbi. I said, Rabbi, what do you think? You think people get upset about the name? He said, are you kidding? It's hilarious. People are going to laugh when they hear it. I said, okay. If the Baptist minister and the rabbi say it's okay, then, you know, it's blessed and it's okay. So we went with that name. So that's just part of, you know, doing a focus group, uh, doing your due diligence, doing your homework. And a lot of people come in to me and they say, Bob, I have an idea I want to run by you. And so they tell me their idea. And then I say, you know, I'll give them two or three companies that are doing the exact same thing and they never heard of them. Well, the first thing you do as an entrepreneur is to look at all the who's in the marketplace. What's the competition? But you know, something else, um, everyone on this call um, hears all the time and everyone, anyone on this call that is an entrepreneur should think about this as a fundamental part of your business. And it's something that we say every year at a big table. Well, you know, this year, a lot of us did it on Zoom. But what do you say on Passover? What's the first question you ask on Passover the four questions? How is this night different from all other nights? So because of that, you know, when I think of a business, the first thing I ask myself is, how is this business idea different than anything else that's out there in the marketplace? That's the fundamental question you ask when you're starting a business. How is your business different than everybody, than everybody else's? Well, that was kind of fundamental to me. So whenever I developed a business, first thing I thought of, how is it different? Manish Tana, how is it different? So, you know, at hotels.com, nobody knew what the internet was. We kind of created a whole marketplace. You know, get a room, we created, um, and we created a totally different 
ways to book hotels. You know, people go online and they, and they, and they find a deal and they call our call center, they can get another 10, 20, sometimes 50 or 60% less by picking up the phone. So we created unique models. We created value propositions in every company that I've been with. You know, another thing that I learned is customer service. Most companies struggle with customer service. They have big manuals, they hire consultants, they have big retreats. You know, customer service at all my companies is very, very simple. Do you know where I learned customer service from? It comes from the third book of the Bible. You know, right? It comes from Vayikra, from, from Leviticus. How are you supposed to treat somebody in Judaism? Treat them the way you want to be treated. So this is the way I train all my people in customer care. I said, I'm going to keep it very simple. No manuals, no retreats, no $500 an hour experts. I said, customer services run. You put yourself in the shoes of the uh, customer and treat them the way you would expect to be treated. That's it. If their request is unreasonable, it's no. If, if, if they should get a refund, because that's a reasonable thing. If you were in their shoes, then they should get a refund. It's very, really very simple. But that's a, that's a concept that, you know, I didn't, go to, I didn't go to business school for that. I didn't get trained for that. But I learned that um, you know, growing up in a Jewish home and going to Jewish day school is that that's, so that's our fundamental way we handle customer service at all the companies I've been in. So those are just, you know, kind of few of the, uh, uh, you know, what I call, what I believe are, major you know major reasons for my success in my various companies are all things that i learned really growing up that i didn't necessarily learn from a business or learn from experience i learned from growing up and i applied those principles you know, in business the other thing is that you know there's always the concept of putting a stumbling block before the blind so this is big in travel you know i'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening in today uh, have taken a flight have rented a car have stayed at a hotel and did you ever have a customer service issue in travel? Has anyone not had a customer service issue in travel? Uh, so, you know, what do you disclose? What level of disclosure do you have? But what do you tell people? Well, for me, it was very simple. You don't put a stumbling block before the blind, so you don't hide anything. So you disclose to your customers, you disclose hidden fees, you disclose, um, you know, the pools closed in the hotel, you just go, the classic example, somebody walks into to a grocery store and they're buying strawberries and they look great. They're plumpy and red and look juicy on the outside. You buy it, you get home, you take the first few out and in the middle, they're all rotten, right? So that's, that's disobeying the fundamental principle of Judaism, which is do not put a stumbling block before the blind. So companies that, you know, follow that biblical principle are the ones that, uh, you know, end up doing well. They end up, you know, people end up being loyal to those customers and loyal to those companies. Level customer service. If you have great customer service, if you treat your customers well, those companies typically do well. Look, for example, a company like Walmart. It's so easy to return. You take it there, they return it. Think about something you bought at other companies. You've gone and you try to return it. They give you a hard time. They say no. They say, well, maybe we'll give you a credit. But you'll never go back to those companies again. But you go to a company that treats you really well, that has great customer service, people are going to patronize those companies. So these are, these are principles. They're really basic principles of Judaism that can help people be successful if you follow them. One of the skills I think I learned at uh, the Charles Easton Jewish State School in Maryland is uh, critical thinking, which I guess is al always asking why I'm digging deeper, like like you said. Um, so I couldn't couldn't agree more. Um, all right, final question: um, Do you have any words of wisdom to those who want to follow their dreams but are afraid to pursue them due to external factors? Well, sure. And let me let me let me just say that there's one more there's one more part about being, say, a Jewish entrepreneur that's different than anyone else. And that's that we have uh, the concept, you know, when you're successful, it's not the end of the day, right? You rise in your career, you put a lot of dollars in the bank. That's not being successful in Judaism. Being successful in Judaism is giving back when you can. So it's sharing part of your knowledge and sharing part of your wealth. It's giving tzedakah. 
And so that's, that's a big part of being a Jewish entrepreneur. And a part of when you reach a level of success, that makes a, a Jewish entrepreneur different than just a typical entrepreneur is that a Jewish entrepreneur wants to give back. And, and in terms of following your dreams, um, you should follow your dreams. Entrepreneurship is, is taking risk. It's taking calculated risks. It's risk and reward. And a lot of people are afraid to take the leap. You know, I practiced law and it was a great salary, but I wanted something more. I, want, I was an entrepreneur at heart. I wanted to try something else. It, I took a big risk. I took a leap, I took a leap of faith. I did it in a conservative way because I split the salary with my partner. So, and I took a leave of absence, so I could always come back. But if you have a passion, if you have a dream, follow it, you know, follow it. And, and not only that, but follow it and do your due, do, do all these things that I talked about earlier, do your due diligence. And how is your idea different than anyone else's? What's your value proposition? How are you gonna bring it to the marketplace? So you definitely should follow your dream. It takes, it takes uh, to really be an entrepreneur, you have to take some risk, but take a calculated risk, assess the risk and assess the reward. You know, in the hotel business, another reason why I went into the hotel business is that it's so large. It's about a trillion dollar marketplace globally. So you know, I just needed a small sliver of it to do well. Uh, so I picked, I picked a field that had potential but it's really all at the end of the day, it's really mostly in the execution. So if you have that great idea, you have that great concept, you have that dream, take your time, plan it, analyze it, assess it, tear it apart, do a focus group like I did, talk to friends, let people tear it apart, listen. It's another thing I learned from Jewish day school is to accept criticism, be humble, be humble. You know, you, no one's right all the time. People make mistakes. And some of the greatest investors in the world admit that they make mistakes. I made lots of mistakes along the way. But you have to be willing to accept criticism. You have to be willing to have your idea torn apart. But be open, be open-minded, do your homework, assess the risk, really think about your value proposition and go for your dreams. Just do it in a smart way. And I'm sure there's no better time to, to pursue your passions than, than now. So thank you very much, Bob, for sharing your knowledge and insight with us tonight um, and giving back, practicing what you teach. Uh, you certainly gave us a lot to think about uh, and a way forward during this crisis. What you may not know is that Bob is a supporter of FIDF's Impact Scholarship Program, which provides full four-year scholarships to former combat soldiers and combat support soldiers from low socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, the IMPACT program is just one of FIDF's educational programs. To see the difference of FIDF's educational programs make, please watch the following short video. and I serve in a Givati Brigade. I serve in the front line on the Lebanon border up north. I grew up without parents. My mom passed away, my father ditched. I had to work since I was seven years old. Even if I wanted to, I cannot finish my high school diploma. I decided I'm gonna join the IDF. I just wanted to be helpful and uh, useful to other people and serve and protect. I wanted to be a part of something. I found out that through the FIDF educational program, you can finish your high school diploma during your service. And I was sent there, it was incredible. I finished my high school diploma, top class. <laughs> I was really moved by finishing something, because most of the time I didn't finish anything in my life. It gave me like a second chance that I actually I'm worth something. If you go outside the outside world, you need to have at least a high school diploma. And now I can say proudly that I actually got it.
As an impact supporter, Bob has given his student Kirill the ability to achieve his dream of gaining a college degree despite facing extreme financial hardships. Bob, there is someone special who would like to say thank you. Hi, Mr. Dino. I am a impact student. I made a Aliyah from the Ukraine on my own and uh, served in the IDF as a lone soldier in the tank unit. After service, I received an impact scholarship and uh, studied in mechatronics, mechanica and electronics at Ariel University. Uh, I now live uh, in Petah Tikva with my wife and two sons and working in engineering. All of that, thanks for you and your support. I thank you very much and I hope to see you in Israel soon. Great, thank you and thanks for your great service to Israel. Very nice. That was awesome. Um, that was really special. As you saw firsthand, the programs and projects FIDF provides the men and women of the FIDF, of the IDF are vital. I hope you cho choose to join me in continuing to support the IDF soldiers as they look out for Israel during this difficult time to make a donation to FIDF and to stay up to date on all of our upcoming events. Please be sure to visit FIDF.org slash engage on behalf of FIDF Young Leadership. Thank you for joining us. Have a great in evening and L'chaim, Bob. All right, Micha, great being on with you. Have a great Thank night. You, Bob. Nice to see you. Bye, everyone. Erev Tov.